Hello, everybody. Welcome. I appreciate everyone who listens and becomes curious about all that we explore in these recordings. I'm certainly very curious, and I need other curious people to quest with, to chase the deepest questions we can find together. And when we're able to do that even a little bit, it changes what it means to be alive, or to be human, or to have a mind. And that seems to me like medicine, especially in a time when, for the humans in general, something has gone catastrophically wrong and probably more than one something. Yeah. And each of us is experiencing this uniquely and very few of the sages are speaking of it. So we don't actually understand that there's an array of distributing, distributive crises in the network of human minds and bodies right now. And there always has been, but it's never been accelerating and diversifying to the degree it is now. Not at least in our lifetimes. We have historical records of such apocalypses and catastrophes. Perhaps Shakespeare was hinting at one that he himself experienced when he said, time is out of joint. For whatever it is that might be going on, and I think it's more than seven things, not merely one, that statement applies very clearly to the circumstances of the moment. And each human being will be differently affected some may not notice it at all. Some may not be able to notice anything else. Synchronization, sequence, routes, all these things having to do with mediating the structure of our temporality in consciousness, awareness, in our bodies. These things have changed very dramatically and everyone is feeling some piece of it, whether they have any awareness of it or are capable of thinking about it usefully or insightfully. The nature of time has changed and it should be obvious that for the humans, technology, the entire purpose is to shrink time. The car shrinks the time it would take you to ride a horse to position X from position Y. The horse shrinks the time it would take for you to walk or run there. The oven speeds time up in a strange way. The refrigerator slows time down in another way. thus preserving the foods so that the interval over which we have to eat them before they spoil is reduced, or actually extended, excuse me. <laughs> Time. In my own thought and consideration, I don't treat time as a unitary linear property of experience. Relativity teaches us that 
not just for observers, but for participants. Um, each distinguishable organism, at least down to the cells, but probably down to the organelles, and the macroorganisms like bats and raccoons and dragonflies and octopi and praying mantises and so on. These are modes of the expression of the character of time space. But they each have distinct world lines. And yes, a praying mantis is conceivable as a single world line, meaning all the positions in space and time it has in, embodied as if its life were a tunnel through space-time shaped as a praying mantis. Try to picture that. The Earth is spinning at x thousand miles per hour, depending on your position on the surface of the sphere. The sun is or you know the Earth is orbiting the sun. The sun is orbiting something in the galaxy. Um, if we map <laughs> the, the tunnel created by the egg that becomes a praying mantis, and we can go back farther than that, and we, we map every position through space-time, we will find a praying mantis-shaped tunnel. And these tunnels exchange information in reality, while we're awake and embodied and walking around in the world. So the, the world is a hyperstructure of world lines, swarming together, exchanging information in time, synchronizing to each other and failing to do so. If there are world lines, it's as if if we take the idea seriously, it's as if each observer slash participant or participant observer is a universe, is its local and relational and distributed effect, universe of being. We might think of it as if all the beings are concentrated in this one being in a general way, and that there's also local uniqueness to this one this one human, this one praying mantis. But there's a vast temporal and relational symphony going on in time, and technology collapses that. Essentially what it does for nearly all organisms is reduce their liberty, health, and survivability, like a parasite would. the technologies. Now, it's not impossible for there to be beings like humans who are intelligent enough to choose better expressions of technological ability and also to know what not to do together, right, all of them, universally. Yeah. We have the opposite situation. We have what I've heard Daniel Schmachtenberger call a race to the bottom, which is a situation in which if you don't, if your people or your group doesn't enact and weaponize technology, someone else will. So do you want them to do it? or you. <laughs> Hopefully there's some kind of measurement of insight, intelligence, and altruism here, but in human cultures there mostly is the opposite. So what that means is if Joe is capable of inventing a technology that would have devastating consequences as a weapon, and Joe resists, then Jim will do it for, for the humans anyway. So now you have a kind of a trap, right? Where Joe doesn't want to create weapons, but Joe figures, well, if anyone's going to create them, at least maybe I could influence it positively somehow. 
and creates them anyway. Because if he doesn't, Jim will. And he doesn't know Jim. And Jim might have worse. Jim might be more immoral. And both of these problems have to do with the compression of time. Um, Joe realizes it is now possible to make Weapon X. Joe is working on technologies that could be associated with Weapon X or um, act as foundations for Weapon X. Joe doesn't want to create weapons, X or otherwise. But if he refuses, he's the one with the skills to do it in this case, in this model. If he doesn't, Jim will, and Jim could be anybody. Jim could be far more selfish, greedy, have a much shorter time span concern, a million dollars to, you know, over the next year and a half, right? Time and money. Money is a mode of compressing time. Work is a mode of compressing time or extending it. All the things that humans do seem to have to do with these two potentials. One, the long view and the short view. And the other, compressing time or extending it. Now consider that nearly all crimes are matters where someone has compressed time in their concerns and actions due to the desire to have or not be subject to something. One of those two things. So, effectively, crimes have to do with the local compression of time in the perpetrator. Right? I can't stand so-and-so, I must kill them. I need to pay the rent, I must steal money. These kinds of things. Very short periods of concern. I'm at the grocery store, this man has made me angry, I'm going to stab him, right, whatever. Um, fight him, at least. All of these involve compression of time. And what do we punish crime with? Extension of dead time. Basically, the idea of prison is the idea of killing almost all the domains of liberty inside time so that it is experienced as suffering. And the basic idea of punishing wrongdoing in short time with suffering in long time has held sway on earth for <laughs> many hundreds of, you know, millions of human lifetimes. Because there's, it's happening right now and there's about 8 billion humans, so that's, you know, it's been happening for their entire lifetime. So that's 8 billion human lifetimes of time. The humans measure time flatly as if a year is just one year. It's not. If you have 8 billion humans, that's 8 billion human life years. And it's important to be able to think in those terms, see in those terms, wonder in those terms. So it occurred to me some days ago that this pol polarization of short-term benefit or goal and long-term benefit of goal or goal and short-term benefit or suffering and long-term um, benefit of su or suffering. <laughs> I almost said benefit of suffering. <laughs> of course, many of the people, not all of them, who've been in prison will sing praises about it. Oh, that's exactly what I needed. You know, I was, I was being stupid and this made me better. Um, certainly not all of them. And I think prisons are system of torture, and torture is always wrong. Now, some um, punishments and systems of punishment um, also introduce the problem of long time, but they do it differently. So, for example, if someone is convicted of being a thief, and you, 
in this culture, the punishment for this is to the removal of the right hand permanently. And you can see the interplay of short benefit, short time, long suffering, long time in this model of quote unquote justice. Uh, that has nothing to do with justice. That has to do with insanity. By the time things have gotten that weird, the <laughs> potential intelligence of the cohorts involved is approaching very little. <laughs> um, it's a dumb idea. There are at least two primary faculties involved in evaluating temporalities. The dreaming mind, for the dreaming mind, instant is an eternity. And the waking mind, for which an instant is valueless. There is an old alchemical riddle that encodes the problem here. One of the great sages of the alchemical traditions, and I cannot recall which one, said something resembling, the key is found in what everyone throws away, ignores, pays no attention to, does not properly value, etc. One of the answers to that riddle is time. The moon is waning from fullness. The clouds are moving past it. It's early in the morning. And I'm trying to understand and see a little bit better than I've seen before. As a human being, each one of us is unique in terms of what we emphasize and remember and quest to understand in consciousness. If we're lucky, we will be endowed with a urge to pursue the amazing questions Good morning. And the urgent questions of our incarnation as humans. What is time? What is light? What is birth? What is death? What's before birth? What's after death? What is dreaming? What is language? Why are the humans broken? What's the origin nature of injustice? These kinds of things, yes? What is time? And time is a symphony. But when whatever is acting as the conductor, or if there are multiple conductors, is significantly disturbed, nothing goes well. Even if the superficial things go well, their roots are trembling and it is not good. And we live in such a time. And as for why, well, we could chase it. But what I want to focus on here is that when we were little, we noticed anomalies. We noticed or at least I did, and some of my friends did too because we were marked on them together, that the adults were confused. Something was broken in them, generally. There were very occasional adults in whom this quality was less predominant or dominant, 
but they were rare. Most of the adults were broken in their thinking. They didn't have the dreaming aspect with them in the waking world. Now, the ancient indigenous peoples are examples of peoples who had the dreaming aspect with them in the waking world, and the white colonists who annihilated them and the ecologies on which they, they were, with which they were symbiotic. Those people were the dream destroyers. They were the dream assassin, the faculty of consciousness that is responsible for ending the dream cycle at night, embodied in the waking world. There should not be people who are dreaming. There should not be dreaming while we're awake. The dreaming mind should at least be evicted, exiled, to the domain of sleep and death. And this faculty is very powerful in the humans, the moderns particularly. They do not consider it. Few people have such a concern. But killing the ecologies, wiping them out and turning them into representations and commodities, is the same kind of behavior as putting an end to the dreaming of the world. It changes the nature of time because the vast biorelational hyperstructures of Earth are the origin and heartbeat of our dreaming. And that dreaming is crucially important. It heals our organs. It restructures memory. It's a heroic medicine to the poison of living in representations. So I spoke of anomalies. Um, one of the early anomalies for me was recognizing that other organisms are complete beings. They have personalities, persona, life history, missions, quests. They're fully fledged beings, but they don't use human language to communicate. They tend to communicate relationally and physically first. Few of them are formally representational, though most of them are capable of forming something resembling a representation. And they live in different time, right? The amount of time, I would suggest that if a human lives 70 years and a mantis lives 11 months, I would suggest that they're experiencing the same amount of biocognitive time so that the mantis experiences time at a vastly higher rate of flow than a human does. But if we imagine that those intervals are the same in terms of how much experience per second you get over the lifetime, the mantis, which can strike at a rate I guess about a thousandth of the firing rate of human visual neurons is in time differently. And when those two creatures come together, a third domain of time is created, the between of them, in which the mantis benefits from the long seeming time of the human, and the human, if they're intelligent at all, will benefit from the inversion the wisdom the mantis acquires by living in fast time compared to that of human time. And what the world does, the ecologies, is they make a vast temporal relational web where all world lines form a fundamental unity and information is shared and transmitted and represented between them 
So if you tear down the ecology and you replace that with machines, you get something that can't participate in living time and yet affects it very dramatically. 50 years ago, the Earth could absorb the technological impact of the desynchronizing influence of machines, but it can no longer do so. <laughs> and so by tearing down the ecologies, the humans are tearing down their own minds and their capacities to dream and know and learn and be human and understand our origins and our most sacred missions that we come to human birth with. Nonetheless, even in a catastrophe like this one, we have the capacity to remember together. <sighs> and this is what I am attempting to do at 4.30 in the morning, walking around some suburban neighborhood where everything is flat and regular. That flatness, that regularity, it's the fingerprint of mechanism. Diversity, rescue, medicine, wonder, awe, fascination, recollection. These are the fingerprints of our dreaming mind. And the waking mind that's trying to snuff it is its own product. <laughs> It's as if it, one of the fingers on the hand took over the whole body, right? That representational figure, that figment, that faculty and consciousness in humans is both the problem and the solution. Anomalies. Ever notice that when you're in an accident, um, a car accident is a great example, but even an accident where one trips or um, loses something in the world that's important. One's ID, one's car keys, one's phone, etc. Right? Um, but particularly physical accidents, time compresses. Right? And Everyone who's been in an accident understands this, even though the humans don't talk about it. People will say things like, the next three seconds seemed like they took half an hour, but I couldn't affect the situation in a car wreck. Um, there are also positive accidents, right? Accidents that don't have negative qualities. And time compresses in those as well, but they're more difficult to give an example of. Notice that sports are a representation that compresses and structures time and behavior according to one specific goal that is being represented. For example, the goal of a touchdown, field goal, etc. So we could see it's blatantly obvious that the humans have a fascination with being distracted. Individual humans will vary over their situations, histories, habits, and so on. But the humans in general, <clears throat> they get very excited about anything that compresses time. Comedians do this. They produce um, hilarious derivations over temporality that ordinary thought uh, occludes, hides, obscures. Essentially what they're doing is they're giving us insight 
but they're doing it in a very playful way most of the time. Um, crime and punishment is all about this war, one of the greatest plagues of our human situation is about this. Do we want to negotiate relationships or do we wish to enforce them? These are two different modes of time. If we take world lines seriously, and I think we should, um, though it's not the only useful perspective, then it's apparent to us that one minute of my life, if we generalize it to just the human population, is around eight billion human life minutes. So which domain of time do we pay attention to? The local or the distributed? Well, how about both and three or four other views? <laughs> Not one or the other, right? And if we extend it beyond the humans to include all of the life forms on Earth, try to just vaguely imagine you're looking at the equivalent of a temporal star. The organisms of Earth are to time as the sun is to light. They make billions of modes of it per second. When there is combat or opportunity, when the three important senses of vigilance, prediction, and ambiguity, when something awakens these and to whatever degree, degree they are awake, the focus is time. What will happen next? If I do this, then what? If I don't do this, then what? These principles are so fundamental to human consciousness most of the time that they dominate it completely without us being aware of it. And all of them deal with, they're all deeply influenced by whether we're thinking in long time or short time, right now or forever. Yeah. We should have at least both. But what I'm trying to emphasize is moments of joy seem, we claim in language that they are timeless. They pervade over the whole arc of our lives. Moments of fulfillment, of victory, of insight, of creativity. But the other kind, so to speak, of time is very local. What will I make for dinner tonight? How can I pay the rent tomorrow? I have a disease, I'm dying. What, can I, what move can I make that matters? Where, do, where does my ne next footstep fall? Almost all of the religions are concerned with long time. They're concerned, their boundary is eternity, right? all the time. But the problems we face in our waking world lives are almost mechanically representational and have to, almost completely to do with short time. And this is why nearly all crime, right? Joe steals, Joe embezzles $100,000 from some bank he works at over five years. 
He's being paid the whole time to work there. What's he actually stealing? Time. For 15 years, he'd have made the $100,000. He wants it now. So you can see how m many of the things people want out, to, out of a relationship or they want into a relationship. Or they want to experience the incredible What goes on in the mind of a serial killer? They are addicted to something. They're experiencing the incredible transformation of time that comes with taking the life of another human being with their hands. You see? And each one is unique and so on. None of that really matters. What they're trying to get is a replacement there's something so stimulating that nothing stimulates me like that in this model of a serial killer. So they become addicted to that incredible intensity. Short time. When we form relationships with each other that last and become enriched over time, it's the opposite of this. Um, we carefully and lovingly create a relationship so profound that it spans our whole lifetimes, even if it only happens in two years. It's long time value. And almost any problem that I've encountered where my own behavior worsened the problem involved my view wasn't long enough. My concerns were immediate. And our cultures train us to this and script us for this. And then everyone's surprised when bad things happen because the temporality of our lives, our experience as humans, our social experience is compressed or it's evicted and we're fed representations instead as if these could or should be fulfilling movies and shows and the internet and so on yeah. endless replications of representations in which we have no role and by which we are crippled largely There's nothing as dangerous as representational cognition in an animal species capable of assembling tools. Well, it's a bit of an overstatement. Um, there are some other really dangerous things, but that thing right there, I'm walking down a street, it's late at night, There's at least 16 cars in my vicinity. What are those? Some would say they are vehicles. No, they are representations of freedom. They are statues of flow. Huh? <laughs> the purpose of the car is to compress time. And it does this very accurately or effectively, we just don't notice until we get into a car accident. <laughs> Orgasm is a moment of incredible intimacy. 
and it's not too difficult to imagine how that could be represented other ways and sold back to us. And I don't just mean physical orgasm. There's all kinds of different orgasms. <laughs> Relational, insightful, creative, uh, hilarious. When a group of humans that, are, that love each other are suddenly laughing together, they're having something resembling an orgasm. There are many different forms of this, and the humans ache for it. They want to know we are truly together with all the costumes off. And even physical combat is a method of getting to something like that. When people have physical altercations, they're having a form of intimacy and time becomes hyper compressed. An instant ago, minutes didn't matter. Quarter hours were maybe the metric and now pieces of seconds matter. So both combatants enter into fast time. And the motivating factors that cause them to collapse to fast time in physical combat give us hints about what's going on there. And perhaps, if we're lucky, what we might do instead that was better and delivered greater intimacy, even than physical combat. But notice the transformation of time at the boundary between we're having some kind of relational transaction at a gas station, perhaps, and we are in physical combat. Notice the boundary there. The nature of time changes absolutely dramatically and becomes extremely quick like that of the mantis. Mm -hmm. Now fractions of a second matter and we have to choose moment to moment what degree of harm are we willing to inflict? And if the answer is any, then there's an incredible liberty there never held in any other part of our lives. Although, it's useful to notice that I think the dreaming mind might have the opposite question. <laughs> what degree of benefit, mutual benefit, could we achieve in the next move? And the dreaming mind is catastrophically faster than the waking mind, weeks of experience can be had by the dreaming mind in a second. Whole lifetimes can, trans can pass before the experiential self, pass within the experiential self in a second or two of dreaming. It's also fast time but not the same, and it's also extremely intimate, but not in the same way physical combat is. All of our behaviors transform temporalities. Our thoughts, our hopes, our actions, our habits, our fears, all of these things, they orbit our sense of time and timing. And when time is compressed, unless the originary purpose was trustworthy and beneficial,
the coherence suffers. And our chance to see and grow and learn and retrieve domains of liberty together and memory takes a hit. Even if there are exceptions. Um, I'm not such a dogmatist that I think all physical violence is fundamentally wrong. (laughs) But if there's eight better nearby moves and we pick that one, there will be a lot of suffering. (laughs) So most of the time I don't think that's a an important way of compressing time. Insight, however, to be able to see better or see anew, that seems like an important and strange kind of orgasmic compression of time. Mm-hmm. It's as if I make a derivation over the long period of my lifetime and suddenly see what I've been blind to Whether or not it's explicitly true, the vision to be able to see and understand and have, ah, ah, yes, now I am seeing this feeling. That, it's a a bit addictive. (laughs) I guess I chase it a lot. But, you know, I have a concern with a race to the bottom. If you keep lowering the standard of insight or thought, awareness or concern, then pretty soon anything qualifies. And the fact that if I don't crawl down the ladder or jump down it, someone else will, I don't care. Yes, that's unfortunate, but I don't truly... The concern is local. It's like, how do I navigate this ship, mine? which includes all those I love and all the living beings of Earth and the living places, but I'm, I'm here locally as Darren. Right? This is the, the vessel over which I have some degree of influence. <laughs> so for me, the imperative is always to see a little bit better. And I fail, ironically, at this all the time. Even having such a heartfelt urgency, um, renders me vulnerable to my human psychology and so on. There's a a double bind here. The frequency of light is a determinant of our experience of time. And light with different frequencies from those the natural world has for billions of human lifetimes um, evolved us to relate with light with the wrong frequencies fucks us up. It desynchronizes things. And it's not just whether faster frequencies are bad. It's rather that the frequency carries something in it. There's an extra component to luminal energy that isn't encompassed by theory. I'm looking at an LED street lamp and it's like being tortured. That is bad light.
the sun and the moon, the light in a forest, the light sparkling on a river, stream or lake, that is good light. That light resynchronizes all the organisms. You see, these are long time influences. But the machines make something very different and the humans have no understanding of its danger. They actually think it's glorious or a kind of a victory of some sort. <laughs> but it's not a victory if you cast your children down the evolutionary ladder <laughs> through injury for the sake of mechanism. That fucks up time. It crowds out the biorelational influences and replaces them with regularity. Terrifying endless regularity, which is the principle we use to punish people in the atrocities we call prisons. I'm walking on cement that is level to within an inch over a mile or two. The cement is totally regular. It's nothing like walking on a living surface. That regularity is experienced as pain by the organism I am because it's the opposite of nature. It changes time. Heroism is another way of compressing time. And that's what the sports games represent. But heroism is something we hold in our hearts and must resurrect together, rather than being served with myriad representations of it, particularly those that are the result of technological advance. In a talk sometime soon, I'll explore questions that orbit the problem of artificial intelligence and the language <laughs> involved. But for now, my walk has come to an end. I'm grateful for our time together and hope that we have seen something new and amazing, useful and encouraging. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to learning time very soon. Bye-bye for now.